Chapter 2 Mindelm was well aware that his brother would be angry with him, but his curiosity had complete reign of him now. Besides, it was all Achilles' fault, truly, and Achilles, at least, should have known better. There was a good nine years difference between the surviving sons of Diomedes, enough that in some ways the pair might as well have been considered other than brothers. Odysseus often acted more like Mindelm's uncle, or, indeed, their father. In fact, from what Mindelm could vaguely recall of his sire, combined with what Cyrus, Tibian, and a few elders had told him over the years, Odysseus could have passed for Diomedes' twin brother, in both look and manner. Mendelm shared some of his brother's features, but was half a foot shorter than Odysseus, and, while strengthened by the necessities of farm life, was not nearly as mighty. His countenance was narrower and longer. From his mother's side, he was told, and he had eyes that were black and glistened like dark jewels. From where those had come, no one in the village could say. But Mendelm had learned early on that if he stared, he could unsettle most anyone save his brother and the man now with him. What do you make of it? Achilles muttered from behind. Mendelm forced his gaze from the hunter's fascinating discovery. Achilles was a blonde, wiry figure, nearly as tall as Odysseus. Unlike Mendelm, who was clad virtually identically to his brother, save for the darker shading of his tunic. Achilles was dressed in a green and brown outfit consisting of a jerkin and pants that allowed him to blend well into their present surroundings. He had soft leather boots designed for padding as silently through the woods as any animal. His slim frame hinted of his sweetness, but belied his strength. Odysseus' brother had tried to string and fire the great bow that was Achilles' pride and joy, tried, and failed. The hawk-faced archer was not just the best at his craft among Serum's inhabitants, but, at least in Mindon's estimation, superior to many a hunter elsewhere. He had watched Achilles match skills against veteran guards from passing caravans, and never had seen him lose. It looks ancient, was all Mendelm could finally answer. He felt some embarrassment. Even Achilles had noticed that. But the hunter nodded as if listening to a sage. Although more than half a decade older than Mendelm, he treated the youngest son of Diomedes as if Mendeln were the fount of all the world's knowledge. That was one of the few points of frustration between Achilles and Odysseus, who saw little practical use in some of his siblings' learning, but did at least tolerate it. The thing is, the archer ran a hand through his thick, almost lean and mane, I've been through this area many a time, and I swear it's never been there before. Mendelm only nodded. His attention once more upon his companion's find, Achilles had an eye such as he could only envy. Mendelm's only vision, often forcing him to peer close at parchments in order to make out the words he so cherished. And at this particular thing, he peered especially close for the symbols etched in its face were, in many places, worn almost clean away by weather and age. Some of them he could have not made out, even if his nose had been pressed against the stone. Clearly, the object before him had suffered long the effects of nature, and yet, how could that be? When it had, by Achilles' declaration, only just appeared. Kneeling before it, Mendeln estimated the dimensions. Just over the length of his foot on each side of the square. 
and had he been standing a hand's breadth below his knee. The flat top was roughly half the dimensions of the base. In size alone, the stone carving should have been impossible to miss seeing. He touched the stone ground before it. Nothing of recent change in the surroundings? No. Mendel traced his finger almost reverently over some of the more legible symbols. Legible only that he could see them, not understand them. One prominent marking seemed to loop in and around itself, giving it no end. As Mendel touched it, he had a sense of incredible age. He involuntarily shook his head. Not age, Odysseans brought, but agelessness. Mendel's mind paused at that sudden notion, never having conceived of it before. Agelessness. How could such a thing be possible? The stone was black, but the markings glittered as if silver. That also fascinated him, for they did not appear to have been painted so. The skill with which the entire thing had been carved bespoke an artisan far more sophisticated than could be found in Serum, or even in any of the larger settlements in the entire western region. Belatedly, men don't realize that Achilles was shaking him by the shoulder. He wondered why. What? The archer leaned warily over him, his brow furrowed deep in concern. The moment you touched it, you seemed to still. You didn't blink, and I'd swear you didn't breathe. I did not notice. Mendon was tempted to touch the artifact again, fascinated to see if the same thing would happen. However, he suspected that Achilles would not like that. Did you touch it earlier? There was a noticeable hesitation then. Yes. But the same thing did not happen to you, did it? Achilles' complexion went pale with memory. No, no. Then what? Did you feel anything? I felt... I felt an emptiness, Mendel. It reminded me of... of death. As a hunter, the blonde man dealt with death on an almost daily basis, usually because of the animals he killed, but occasionally because of close scrapes with wild boars, cats, or bears, where, for a time, he became the prey. Yet, the manner in which Achilles spoke of death now gave it a new and far more ominous connotation, one which, oddly, stirred further curiosity, not fear, in the heart of his companion. What about death? Mendel asked almost eagerly. Can you describe it better? Was it Achilles' expression suddenly guarded, cut him off with a sharp slash of his hand? That's all, I went for you right after. Clearly, there was much, much more involved, but Odysseus' brother did not push. Perhaps he could slowly gain the information over time. For the moment, he would satisfy himself with the stone artifact. Mendel seized a small broken branch and scraped the ground near the bottom edge. The mysterious relic appeared to be planted deep in the soil, but how far? Was there more beneath the surface than above? Again, the temptation came to touch it, this time grabbing hold with both hands in order to see if he could move the piece at all. How much more useful it would be if Mendel could take it back to the farm so as to study it at his leisure. Mendel's head shot up. The farm! Odysseus! He leapt to his feet, startling the generally unperturbable Achilles. The stone's discovery seemed to have upset the archer in a way Mendel could have never seen before. Achilles was known for his fearlessness, but now he seemed to look to Mendel for reassurance, certainly at first. I have to get back, he explained to the hunter. Odysseus will be wondering where I am. Mendel did not like disappointing his older sibling, even though Odysseus would not have shown any such emotion. Nevertheless, 
Mendel lived with the memories of the terrible burdens Odysseus had taken on with the sickness and, later, deaths of their loved ones. The younger brother felt beholden to the older for that reason, not to mention many others. Lesser ones. What about that? Achilles grumbled, gesturing at the stone with his bow. Do we just leave it like that? After a moment's consideration, Mendel replied, We shall cover it over. Help me with it. The two of them gathered loose branches and bits of leafy shrubbery. Yet, although they quickly had the artifact hidden from sight, Mendel felt as if it still stood naked to the world. He considered covering it further, then decided to make do with what they had already done. The first opportunity he had to return it, he would. As Mendel focused on the path back, he belatedly noticed that the weather had taken an odd and very sudden turn. The day had been fairly clear and bright before, but now clouds began to gather in earnest to the west, as if in preparation for a major storm. The wind had also begun to pick up. That's odd, murmured Achilles, also evidently seeing the change for the first time. It is, yes. Odysseus' brother did not understand the wind and weather in terms of hunting, as his companion did, but rather in measurements of currents and such. Mendel constantly saw the aspects of farm life in such terms, and while Odysseus, who knew weather only in how it affected the crops and his animals, constantly shook his head at his brother's ways, he could not deny that once in a while, Mendel had come up with some idea that it helped ease their tasks a bit. The clouds rapidly thickened. Mendel said nothing more to Achilles about the strange weather, but at one point when the archer moved a step ahead, Odysseus' brother glanced back in the direction of the stone, glanced back, and wondered. Odysseus too noticed the peculiar shift in the weather, but chalked it up to one of those quirks of nature to which a farmer had to grow accustomed. He hoped that Mendel would return soon from wherever Achilles had dragged him. Even then, it was likely that the two brothers would have to make part of their journey home in the rain. The sudden accumulation above hinted at a particularly powerful storm brewing, but Odysseus hoped that, perhaps, it would hold for a time before unleashing its full force. If he and Mendel could at least make it past the Low Fork, where the trail often flooded, then they would be all right the rest of the way. Hands clutching the reins, he sat on the wagon eyeing the direction in which Cerinthia had indicated the pair had gone. Both Mendel and Achilles surely had sense enough to see what he did and react properly. At least, Achilles did. As he waited, his mind drifted back to a face framed in gold. Even though Odysseus had seen her only two brief times, he knew that he would not soon forget the vision of her. It had been due to not merely her beauty, memorable enough by itself, but the manner in which she had talked and acted. There had been something about the noble woman that had instinctively made Odysseus want to protect her, as he had no other, not even his brother at the time of their family's deaths. Lilia. The farmer ran the name over and over in his thoughts, savoring the musical beauty of it. The sky rumbled, finally jarring him back to the present. Recalling Mendel and Odysseus stood up in hope of getting a better view, surely the two had to be almost back in Serum by now. A flash of green caught his attention, but not the green that made up part of the hunter's woodland garments. Rather, it was an emerald green that instantly caused Odysseus to jolt in attention. His brother and friend utterly forgotten. Lilia slowly strode into the woods beyond, leaving the safety of the village. From her passive expression, it seemed very likely that she did not even notice the potential threat from the sky. In this region, the storms could suddenly grow so vicious as to uproot trees without warning. Leaping down, Odysseus secured the wagon, then headed after her. Although the farmer mostly ran after Lilia out of concern, excitement also filled him. 
He had no illusions about his chances with one of her blood. But at the same time, his heart pounded at the thought of at least speaking with the noblewoman again. Odysseus caught sight of her again just as the wind doubled. Despite the worsening conditions, Lilia still appeared not to notice. Her lips were pursed and her gaze were fixed downward. Despite the swift pace Odysseus kept, he did not manage to catch up to her until well into the woods. The towering farmer started to reach out a meaty hand, then thought better of it. He did not want to take any chance of frightening her more than he had to. Whatever weighed on her thoughts clearly weighed heavily. Seeing no other option, Odysseus cleared his throat. Lilia straightened sharply, then looked behind her. Oh, tis you. Forgive me, my lady. A shy smile immediately came to her lips. I told you, to you I am Lilia. What I was once, I can never be again. As his expression turned to one of confusion, she added, But what do I call you, Sir Farmer? He had not realized that he had never introduced himself. I am Odysseus, son of Diomedes. A rattle of thunder reminded him of their current circumstances. My... Lilia, you shouldn't be out here. There's what seems to be a fierce storm brewing, but if you seek shelter, likely in the cavern. It's one of the strongest of buildings in Serum. A storm? She glanced skyward and for the first time appeared to register the change. The clouds had thickened to the point that day had almost turned to night. Daring her disdain, he finally took hold of Lilia by the wrist. There doesn't look to be much time. But Lilia instead turned her gaze in another direction, and a breath later let out a small gasp. Odysseus followed her eyes, but saw nothing. Nonetheless, the noblewoman stood frozen, as if whatever had caught her attention shocked her senseless. Lilia, Lilia, what is it? I thought I saw... I thought... But, no. Even when he stood next to her, the farmer could see no cause for her alarm. Where is it? What did you see? There. She pointed out a particularly dense area of the woods. I think... He was tempted to simply take her back to Serum and return after the storm but the intensity of her reaction made him worry about what lay out there. Mindeln settling came to mind. Mindeln, who was still missing. Stay here, Odysseus started forward at the same time, drawing his knife. The brush thickened, and at times the wild grass rose as high as his waist. How Lilia had seen anything was beyond him. But he trusted that this was no wild goose chase. Then, as he neared the area in question, Odysseus' hackles rose. A sense of dread rose over him, nearly causing the stalwart farmer to backtrack. A faint but sickly scent wafted under his nose. It brought back memories of the plague, of his family. Odysseus did not want to take another step closer, and yet he did. The sight before him made the farmer fall to one knee. It was all he could do to keep his last meal in his stomach. His knife slipped from his hand, utterly forgotten in the face of the horrific revelation before him. What had once been a man, at least from the height, Odysseus decided it must be so, lay strewn across the patch of ground at the base of the first trees. His entire torso had been expertly sliced open, much the way the farmer would have done to a cow after slaughter. Blood soaked everything in the immediate vicinity and had turned the dirt in some places to crimson mud. Part of the victim's own stomach had poured out of the cut and flies already clustered over the tremendous stench-ridden bounty. As if cutting open the body had not been terrible enough, the throat had been slit open sideways, the gap large enough to admit a fist. The face was covered with blood from the wounds, and the leaf and other refuse decorated, like some bizarre festival display. After a long study, 
Aldisian finally determined that he did not know the man, who was roughly his age and with black hair now caked with gore. It was what remained of the shredded garments that finally identified the unfortunate figure for the son of Diomedes. The robe's coloring alone was sufficient in itself, but the symbol of the missionary's order left no doubt whatsoever. Odyssean had found Brother Caligio, the missing acolyte from the Triune. A gasp from behind startled him. He spun about to see Lilia, whoop, taking in the, the awful sight. She suddenly went pale. Her eyes fluttered upward, showing only whites, and then she began to fall. Pushing himself to his feet, Odysseus managed to catch her just before she could strike the ground. He held her prone body for a moment, at a loss what to do. Someone had to be told about the murder, likely Captain Tiberius, chief of the Serum Guard. Dorius, the village's leader, would also need to know. In his arms, the noblewoman moaned. Odysseus decided that, first, he had to take care of Lilia. Fortunately, it took little effort for the towering farmer to carry her. Odysseus moved at as swift a pace as he could without risking his precious burden. He had to watch his footing at all times, fearful that one false step would send both of them crashing. It was with great relief that Odysseus reached the edge of the village. The sky continued to thunder loudly, but the storm so far held back. Odysseus! He stumbled at the sound of his own name, nearly tossing Lilia away in the process. The farmer managed to steady himself, then looked to the source of the call. A great fear lifted off his chest as Mindel and Achilles came rushing up to him. They had clearly just arrived themselves. Mindel was slightly out of breath, and Achilles had a pale expression that the elder son of Diomedes suspected mirrored his own. Even though Achilles could not yet know about the grisly discovery. As the pair came up to him, he immediately growled, There's a body out in the woods behind me, near where the forest first thickens. Eyeing the farmer's burden, the hunter muttered, an accident? No. Achilles grimly nodded. He pulled a bolt from his quiver, notched the bow, and without hesitation went off in that direction. What of her? Mendel asked. Who is she? Is she harmed in any way? She fainted. Odysseus felt unusually anxious. He kept hoping that Lilia would awaken, but she remained a limp bundle in his arms. She saw the body too. Should we take her to Jerilia? Jerilia was Serum's healer woman, an elderly figure some believed half-witch, but who was respected by all for her skills. It was she who had given the brothers the herbal mixtures that had at least eased some of their stricken family's agony. To both Odysseus and Mindel, she had done far more than all the prayers combined. Odysseus shook his head. No, she just needs to rest. She must have a room at the boar's head. He hesitated. But we can't bring her through the front door like this. There is a back way near the steps leading to the upper rooms, Mendel said with far more calm than the situation would have warranted for most other people. You could take her through there while I go speak quietly with Tibian in order to find which one is hers. His brother's suggestion made perfect sense. Aldisian exhaled gratefully. We'll do that. Mendel studied him for a moment perhaps reading deeper into his brother than Odysseus preferred. As far as the younger son of Diomedes was concerned, Lilia was a perfect stranger, yet clearly she was not so with Odysseus. Rather than explain all now, Odysseus hurried on. A moment later, Mendon caught up. They spoke no more, intent on their efforts. Owing to the inclement shift in the weather, they were not hindered by any startled passerby. That both pleased and frustrated Odysseus, who wanted Lilia safely in her room, but also wanted to let someone of authority 
know about the Acolyte's heinous slaughter. He finally satisfied himself with the knowledge that Achilles would certainly contact the guard or the headman. Mendel left him as the pair near the boar's head. Slipping around the back, Odysseus found the other doorway. With some manipulation, he managed to get the noblewoman inside without losing his grip on her. Inside, he wasted no time heading up the wooden staircase. Fortunately, most eyes in the tavern section turned to his brother, who had apparently timed his entrance to coincide with Odysseus. As Odysseus raced up, he heard Mendon greet a couple of those seated with a slightly louder than average voice. At the top, he waited. After what seemed an eternity, his younger brother finally joined him. She had no quarters, Mendon explained, so I had to arrange for some. With our credit. Was that alright? Odysseus nodded. He looked at the five doors, which... This one, his assembly replied, pointing to a lone door further from the rest, more private. With a look of grim approval, Odysseus had Mendelan open the way for him. This being Serum, the room was fairly austere. Other than a framed bed with down comforter and a table and chair near the single window, there was no furniture. There were hooks in the walls for cloaks and such, and a space for traveler's bag or trunk. Mendel noted the last before. Odysseus could say anything. She must have belongings with the caravan. Shall I go to Cerinthia and take care of it? While he hated involving Cyrus' daughter in this situation, Odysseus could see no other choice. Go ahead. Mendelm paused at the door, meeting his brother's gaze. He asked, How do you know this woman? We met by chance, was all Odysseus would return. After a moment, Mendelm finally nodded and left the room. Gently placing the noble woman on the bed, the farmer paused to look at her. Again, he was struck by the perfection of her face, and wondered what could have sent her wandering alone in the world. Certainly, Lilia could have found a good marriage with many a wealthy noble. Was she related by blood, perhaps, to one of the losing mage clans? Well, that might explain the matter. As he pondered this, her eyes abruptly opened. Gasping, Lilia bolted into the sitting position. What? What happened? Do you remember the woods? Her hand went to her mouth as she stifled another gasp. It was all... all true, then. What I saw? Odysseus nodded. And you, you brought me here. Where is here? The boar's head. It's the only inn in Serum, Miss Lilia. We thought you likely had a room here. But I do not... He shrugged. My brother took care of that. Then we brought you up here. After that, Mendel went to retrieve your things from the caravan. She stared long and hard into his eyes. Mendel and your brother, they are the same person, I gather? Yes. The noble woman nodded to herself, then asked, And the, the body? A friend is looking into it. He can be trusted to deal with the matter properly. Achilles will alert the guard, then our headman. Lilia drew her knees up to her chin, then hugged her legs. That she badly wrinkled her elegant gown, she did not seem to care. Was the... Was the man we found also a friend of yours? Him? Odysseus shook his head. A damned missionary from the Temple of the Triune. His companions were looking for him earlier. He considered. They came with the caravan. Did you? I saw them, yes, but never spoke. I have little trust in their teachings, or that of the cathedral, for that matter. This admission, so near to his own thoughts concerning the two sects, inexplicably lightened Odysseus' heart. Then the farmer quickly berated himself. However, much his calling repelled Odysseus. The man had not deserved such a monstrous end. Thinking of that, Odysseus knew that he had to go and see the situation. 
as the one to initially come across the dead missionary, it behooved him to tell the village officials what he knew. His brow arched as he considered the noblewoman. He would avoid speaking of Lilia as much as possible. She had already been through too much. I want you to stay here, he commanded inwardly, shunned, that he should talk to the lady of such high caste. Stay here and rest. I have to see those who will deal with the body. You needn't come. But I should be there, should I not? Only if necessary. You merely saw what I saw after all, and you didn't know him either. She said nothing more, but Odysseus had the clear impression that Lillian knew that he risked his reputation by protecting her so. The noblewoman leaned back on the bed. Very well, if that is what you wish. I will wait here until I hear from you. Good. He started for the door, already formulating his explanation. Odysseus? He looked at her. Thank you. Face flushing, the farmer ex exited. Despite his sides, he moved silently down the steps. At the bottom, he glanced into the tavern. Everyone saw he acted as if nothing was wrong, which meant that news of the corpse had not yet filtered inside. Achilles could be thanked for that discretion. Sarum would be in shock soon enough, the last murder having taken place more than four years ago and that due to a drunken altercation between old Aronius and his stepson Gimmel over farming rights, with the latter coming out the loser. Once sober, Aronius had pleaded his guilt and had been driven off by wagon to the great city to dutifully pay for his deeds. But the butchery Odysseus had witnessed had not been due to strong drink. This looked more like the work of some madman or beast. Surely an outsider, some brigand passing through the region. Growing more certain of this with each breath, Odysseus vowed to bring it up the moment that he spoke with the headman and the guard commander. The men of Sarum would be more than willing to volunteer to search the area for the bastard. This time, the crime would be handled locally. A good strong rope would end the matter, as it should. It was all such a fiend deserved. He opened the back door and slipped out. There! There is the man of whom I speak! Odysseus retreated into the doorway, startled. Before him stood Tiberius, a beefy man against whom the farmer had wrestled during festival events and lost to more than he had won, and gray-haired Vulpine Dorius, who had staring at Odysseus as if never having seen him before. Behind them stood more than a dozen other men, most of them from the guard, but also Achilles and the two other acolytes of the temple. The older male was, in fact, the one who had spoken, and now stood pointing accusingly at the perplexed farmer. Recovering, he looked to the hunter. Did you tell them everything? Before Achilles could answer, Dorius interjected. You're not to speak to him, hunter. Not yet. Not until all the facts be known. The facts are known, declared the triune's emissary. His female companion nodded over and over as he spoke. At the moment, there seemed nothing pious or peaceable about the pointing finger. You are the one responsible. Your own words brand you. Confess for the sake of your soul. Odysseus fought to keep his distaste for the acolyte from overcoming his reason. If he understood the man correctly, then the farmer had just been accused of the very murder he had been trying to warn them about. Me? You think I did it? By the stars, I should take you and Odysseus, murmured Achilles anxiously. The son of Diomedes regained control. To the archer, he said, Achilles, I told you where to find the body. You saw my expression and... He halted, not wishing to draw in Lilia. And you know me, Dorius. You were friends with my father. I swear by his grave that I'm not the fiend who so foully slew this jabbering fool's comrade. He would have gone on, 
but the headman waved him silent. His expression stern, Dorius replied, "'Tis not him we speak about at the moment, Oldisian. Nay, we speak of the other. Though it might very well be that we'll need to be returning to that before long, as I don't believe in no coincidence. Other? What other? Captain Tiberius snapped his fingers. Instantly, half a dozen men, half a dozen men, whom Odysseus had known from childhood on, moved to surround the farmer. Achilles tried to intercede. Doris, is this necessary? This is Odysseus. Your words respected, young Achilles, but this is duty. The head man nodded to the man in the circle. I'm certain that I'll be able to work all this out, Odysseus. Just let us do what the situation demands. But for what? For possibly murdering a man, grunted Captain Tiberius, one hand on the sword at his side. Odysseus see the guard commander carry the weapon only a few times in all the years he had known him. But with all but one of those being for the aforementioned festivals and other special events... The lone exception had involved the murder of Gimmel. Shaking his head, the farmer roared, But I told you that I didn't slay his companion. Tis not him we're talking about, Dorius declared. But it's one of a similar calling, which makes this worse, young Odysseus. It's the one hailing from the Cathedral of Light, who'd been found slain. The one... Odysseus trailed off, his thoughts in turmoil. But I just spoke to the man a short time ago. Less than an hour, if even half that. Spoke to the man and threatened him in the process before several witnesses. Aye, you recall him, I see. Yes, young Odysseus. The honored emissary of the cathedral was found with his throat cut open. And tis your knife jutting out of the gap made.